I'm Laura Rose, and this is a Colors Podcast. When we think of colors, our minds inevitably turn to the visible. That should be no surprise, our eyes are built for it. They contain cone cells, which come in three types. The long wavelengths, which one cell interprets as red, medium wavelengths, which another interprets as green, and short wavelengths, which the third interprets as blue. We see spectrums of white, gray, black, brightness and darkness. From these combinations, we can see everything from the dull tans and golds of parched grasslands to the vibrant rainbows of emerald, sapphire, ruby, and violet spilling from the stained glass of a cathedral, leaving dappled pools of color across the flagstone floor. But what about colors that are, to us, invisible? The cells in our eyes permit us to track that red-green-blue combo. But consider, there's an entire category of butterflies that has six kinds of photoreceptors. And then there are mantis shrimp, which might have up to 12 spectral receptor types. That's a lot more than just our three. Which leaves us with the question, if we humans have something more than just our rods and cones, what other colors might we see? What other things might we see? Let's travel to another dimension, the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition. Our journey into a wondrous land of imagination takes us, perhaps not to the twilight zone, but to an equally enthralling place. Imagine, you're standing in an ancient stone hallway. The walls glisten with condensation, and tiny chips of mica make the flagstones shimmer in the torchlight. The air is chilly against your skin. From far off, you hear the indecipherable mumble of a human voice. It traces unusual patterns, its rhythm and cadence unlike any language you know. Then, a pause. The stones under your feet give a deep rumble, and you look down to see glowing runes flare to life in the glittering stone. They are a strange color, one you've never seen before, a kind of fluorescent greenish-yellow-purple. The runes seem to rush ahead, glowing in brightness as they stream down the hallway, lighting the path ahead of you. They reach a heavy wooden door and arc up, arcing over the doorframe in a solid, twisting frame of brilliance. A single, vivid pulse of their eerie light, and they're gone. The hallway is lit only by torches once more, but after the brilliance of the runes, the half-light feels as murky as midnight. You stumble ahead, heart pounding in your throat. The thrumming voice on the other side of the door has returned. Closer now, but still indistinct. A strange aura glows around the hinges, pulsing slightly in time with the words. Hands trembling, you reach out and twist the knob. The door swings open and you are bathed in green-purple light. At the center of a small room in front of you is a bubbling, smoking cauldron, radiating the oddly colored light. As your eyes adjust, you can just make out a shadowy robed form standing behind it. Its head tilts upright and it straightens pulling a giant ladle from the pot and shaking the drops off. I say, you sure took your time? An old man chirps from behind his massive hat. All you can make out of his face is a bulbous nose and a bushy mass of eyebrows and beard that would make a sheepdog proud. He snorts a puff of air up, and the tangled mess lifts high enough to reveal a cheerful, beady eye peeking out. Come in, come in, make yourself comfortable! He hangs the ladle on a hook and hobbles over to a tartan armchair resting next to the cauldron, giving it a pat. Clouds of dust billow into the air. They catch the strange light from the cauldron and illuminate the room with a haze-like halo of the same odd electric green-purple-pink. Then, before you really have a chance to admire this underground aurora borealis, the dust cloud hits your nose. You find yourself bent over next to the old man, gasping and wheezing and surreptitiously trying to clear your nostrils of the rush of mucus rallying to your lungs' defense. <coughs> oh, <coughs> oh dear, <coughs> the wizard moans between gasps, then gives a long, juicy sniffle capable of clearing a drain pipe. It really has been too long since I last had company. I do apologize. You think I remember to push around the old broom before you arrived? At this, you cast a skeptical glance around the room. Cobwebs and dust bunnies abound. You can't help but hypothesize that the good old broom would have had the efficacy of a hairdryer applied to an iceberg of the aircraft carrier capsizing variety. I'll forget me own head next, he mumbles, waving a hand in front of his face. Darn stuff! Shoo! Shoo! He waves both his hands in a banishing motion, and bright balls of light shaped like butterflies burst from his fingers. You watch in awe as they flicker and dance, their bodies the same eerie greenish purple shade as the runes and the cauldron and the dust halo. Their tiny wings beat heroically, hurting the dust into valiant tornadoes toward the dustpan. They converge and disappear in a whoomph, 
All that's left is a neat little pile of fine grey in the dustpan, and a room full of pristine air. What were those? You breathe. The old man looks up from where he's kneeling next to the cauldron, ladle in one hand and tiny porcelain cup in the other. You could see them? I dare say, how extraordinary, how very. Not many folks on the Discworld can see, Octarine. He dunks the ladle again, reaching for the second cup. It's the color of magic, you know. Can only be seen by wizards. Mmm, and witches. Oh, oh, and cats. Need something called, um, oh, what are they, uh, octagon cells, in addition to the old rods and cones, or so I'm told. You must have some magic in you. Now! He holds up the two steaming porcelain cups and breaks into a wide grin. How about a nice cup of tea? The Discworld. This fantasy land, created by the great British writer Terry Pratchett, features many wonders, and among them is Octarine, the eighth color, the color of magic, said to be a sort of fluorescent yellow, greenish, purplish color. Its presence indicates magic. Pratchett describes it thusly, it was the king color of which all the lesser colors are merely partial and wishy-washy reflections. It was Octarine, the color of magic. It was alive and glowing and vibrant, and it was the undisputed pigment of the imagination, because wherever it appeared it was a sign that mere matter was a servant of the powers of the magical mind. It was enchantment itself. Many of Pratchett's fans are obsessed with Octarine. Its hypothetical existence offers tantalizing possibilities. Just like there are smells we've never encountered before, perhaps there are colors too. With a single sniff or a single glance, our understanding of the world could change. People claim to catch glimpses of octarine in soap bubbles, gemstones, peacock feathers, lens flares, even the afterglow of lightning bolts. And the scholar of magic Pete Carroll once went on the record to say that he imagines octarine to be a particular shade of electric pinkish purple, a common color in optical illusions. Color palettes imagine octarine to consist of the brilliant lime green of Kermit the Frog's ruff, melded with the deep purple of a well-buffed eggplant. Fans even went so far as to submit an official petition to the International Union of Applied Chemistry to name Element 117 as Octarine. To quote the petition, According to disc mythology, Octarine is visible only to wizards and cats, and is generally described as a sort of greenish-yellow-purple color, which seems perfect for what will probably be the final halogen in the periodic table. Octarine is also a particularly pleasing choice, because not only would it honor the world-famous and much-loved author, but it also has an E-N ending, consistent with the other elements in Group 17. Alas, the petition did not succeed in its objective, but with 52,000 supporters, you can't blame them for trying. So, beyond the magic and imagination, what is the appeal of Octarine? I would argue that it taps into fundamental human color associations. Clearly, the green-purple association with creative innovation slash magic is nothing new. Consider the recurrent yellow-green portals, lights, slime, and miscellaneous mad scientist trappings in the recent show Rick and Morty. Or step back a few decades and admire the ectoplasm in Ghostbusters, the ooze in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or even the original Dungeons & Dragons so-called green slime. Then take another step back. Do you remember the powerful sorcerer Mickey Mouse is apprenticed to? What colors radiated from his magic hat and glowed around his claw-like hands as he waved and conjured? Or the evil queen in Snow White? What shades glowed duskily in her mirror or bubbled ominously in her cauldron? Or the wicked fairy from Sleeping Beauty? What color light radiated from her staff, her enchanted spindle, or the flames that poured from her terrible dragon? Lime green purple? You have to admit, the two colors, lime green and purple, really are quite otherworldly. The presence of purple in nature is quite rare, so perhaps that is why we associate it with the artificial and the unconventional. Then there are those yellow-gray greens, the color of hazardous chemicals and hazmat suits. Then consider Octarine's fluorescence. Our minds once again jump immediately to the mysterious. There is the infamous radium glow. In books and movies, you can tell when an element is radioactive because it glows. What color is that movie radiation? Usually an eerie phosphorescent green. Finally, the eerie light from bioluminescence, the light produced and emitted by living organisms like fireflies, glowworms, and plankton. Strange flora like foxfire fungus can produce enough light to read by, and flotillas of bioluminescent bacteria can create glowing water, so-called milky seas, bred enough to be seen from space. Could there be a more wild, unpredictable, awe-inspiring association? Perhaps Terry Pratchett's invented color has a grain of truth in it. There is a color of magic, or at least of our collective imagination. 
and that color might as well be octarine. <laughs>